In 1844, Joseph Smith preached a sermon at General Conference called the King Follett Discourse. In it, he taught that God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. And, quote, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. And, quote, you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, the same as all, the same as all gods have done before you. In a subsequent sermon called The Sermon in the Grove, Smith reinforced this idea by teaching that Heavenly Father has a father. Since then, Latter-day Saints have often used the Lorenzo Snow couplet, as man is, God once was, as God as man may be, as a vehicle for summarizing Smith's teaching. LDS leaders have historically developed this idea in various ways. I recommend these two overviews in Volume 60, Issue 3 of BYU Studies Quarterly. This has resulted in affirming that sinners can someday be forgiven and exalted as heavenly parents over other worlds. Over a decade ago, I started a project called GodNeverSin.com. I asked Latter-day Saints if they believed Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal prior to his exaltation. About one-third conclusively answered in the negative, sometimes inferring from Joseph Smith's use of John 5.19 that the Father was a sinless mortal like Jesus, perhaps even a, as a savior for other worlds. About two-thirds instead essentially answered yes, that Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal with varying degrees of probability and indeterminacy. FAIR, an LDS apologetics website, even published a page affirming that, quote, for some, the idea that God may have once been a sinner like us gives added hope and faith in the atonement. The same page goes on to ask, concerning whether God may have once been a sinner, quote, does it really matter all that much? The Latter-day Saints are divided over whether Heavenly Father may have once been a sinful mortal. They seem more united over, on the position that even if God had previously sinned, that it would not matter, either systematically or existentially. I would like to give you six reasons why it matters that God never was a sinful mortal. The first reason is the united beauty of God's eternally perfect perfections. Here I mean that all of God's perfections describe all of God, and all of his perfections describe all of his other eternal perfections. He is not just perfect, he is eternally perfectly perfect. Consider Revelation 1 verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Note here that God is not merely Almighty, but he is eternally Almighty. His eternality is omnipotent. And his omnipotence is eternal. And he is not to be worshipped merely for who he is today, but for who he always was. Look also at how the angels worship God in Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God is not merely holy, he is supremely holy. Again, God is worshipped not merely for who he is, but also for who he always was. His power is eternally holy, and his holiness is eternally omnipotent. For the angels, this isn't a point to score in a debate. This matters because it is central to worship. Just think about this. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Secondly, that God was God from everlasting is cause for our humility and encouragement. In Psalm 90, verse 2, we read, From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So, teach us to number our days. In Deuteronomy 33, 27, God's eternality is our, sh our shelter. Quote, The eternal God is your refuge, and his everlasting arms are under you. In Habakkuk 1, 12, this is reason for our comfort and trust. Quote, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. If God was a sinful mortal, he would not be God from everlasting. And he would not be able to provide ultimate protection and comfort. Nor would he be ultimately trustworthy. And that brings us to our third reason that God is ultimate. In Hebrews 6.13, we read that God has no one greater by whom to swear. So he swore by himself. In Exodus 3.14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. God is not defined by something other than himself. He does not participate in something 
bigger than himself. He doesn't conform to something else, and he doesn't abide by a higher law. God is his own highest standard. He isn't a member of a larger class, and he isn't of a species of beings. He is the great, what? I am. This is why the Israelites confess together, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He wasn't merely their particular God in covenant with them. He was also singular in his ultimacy. He is incomparable and supreme and unique. If God were once a sinful mortal, then none of this would be true. He would have been under the judgment of another, having transgressed a higher law than himself, in need of forgiveness from another, receiving the atonement of another, and under the superiority of another. He would not be the great I am. If God was once a sinful mortal who later became loving, he would have to say, I loved because someone else first loved me. But the Bible does not ascribe to God a secondary love. After all, God is not merely loving. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Sorry, I'm going to give you a coffee. Oh, thank you. God is not merely bright. Rather, God, according to 1 John 1, 5, God is light. If God was a sinful mortal in the past, he would not be love itself or light itself or truth itself. He would not be ultimate. He would be someone who conformed to or imitated or participated in those greater realities than himself. Our fourth reason is the relationship between God's aseity to grace. What is that? Please take this home with you, this term. It's a gorgeous attribute. Aseity means that the fountain of God's abundant life has always been of himself. So, ah, say, of himself. Look at Romans eleven thirty four to 36 with me. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who, has been, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. See here again that God is celebrated not merely for who he is, but for who he always has been. No one has ever taught him anything. He knows everything, but he's learned nothing. No one has ever given God a gift. Jesus taught, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. This makes God the most blessed being because he has only ever given. He has never been a beneficiary. He has only been a benefactor. He has never received what he did not have. All things are what? From him, through him, and to him. Because God has always been his own fountain of life and never drank from another fountain, and because God has always, as it were, breathed his own life, and he's never been given breath by another, because God has always only been from himself, through himself, and to himself, without any dependence on another, he is best able to give. The one who has everything yet received nothing is the best gift giver. The one who has never needed anything can best provide for you. The one who has never needed grace is best able to give you grace. If God was once a sinner, he would have needed grace, and therefore he would have been the most he would not have been, he would not be, in that case, the most blessed giver of grace. Our fifth reason is the boasting principle. We see this at work in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, where Paul says, What do you have that you did not receive? If, you, if then you received it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Another way to say this is that we can't brag as though what we have came from us. Everything we have is from God. This makes us very different from God. Only God has ever been from himself, through himself, and to himself. So God alone can properly boast in himself. And this is all over scripture. See, especially Isaiah 40 to 48. God boasts, he revels, he glories in himself as the incomparable, unique source of everything good and true and beautiful. 
He is the first and the last. He's never learned, and he will not share his glory with another. Man is doubly unable to boast in himself. To start, we are creatures, and we depend on God for our very existence. Paul says of a man's dependence on God, in him we live and move and have our being. Additionally, we are sinners, and salvation is designed to prevent boasting in ourselves and instead to highlight God's aseity, not ours. Consider Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not, of your, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Ding, ding, ding. So that no one may boast. Thus, the atonement was not designed to enable you to boast in yourself or to have others boast in you. Rather, the atonement forgives and purifies people into glorified beings who boast what? In God as the source of all things. Let the one who boasts boast what? In the Lord. If God was a sinner cleansed by an atonement, he could not rightly boast in himself nor command others to boast in him. If, God, if such a God boasted, we should say with Paul to this puny demigod, what do you have that you did not receive? If you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Finally, it matters existentially whether God was once a sinful mortal because true worship concerns itself with the very truth and nature of God. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Appealing to the very nature of God, Jesus says to the woman at the well that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The first four of the Ten Commandments concern our worship toward God. And the greatest of the commandments is to what? It's to love God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. Good works that are indifferent to the eternally unique nature of God are, in fact, bad works. They are not done to God's glory. They are not done in the spirit of truth. And they are not done in dependence upon ultimate grace. In conclusion, it is not incidental or non-essential whether God ever was a sinful mortal. It is systematically and existentially important because of the unity of God's eternally perfect perfections, because it is the basis for humility and encouragement, because God is ultimate, because his eternally unique, maybe say it with me, aseity, aseity is the basis for his grace. But the atonement, also because the atonement forgives and cleanses sinners from boasting in themselves to boast instead in the one who alone has never received what he has. And because true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This existentially matters. It concerns the whole Christian life, all of our works, all of our nitty-gritty, ordinary, daily faith and dependence and worship and obedience and fellowship and community and the very meaning of life. Ultimately, it should matter to us because it matters to God. If you don't think this matters, then I call you to repent and to join the angels who throughout this whole presentation have never stopped saying, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Before I get into the meat of what I had to say, I just want to address one possible misconception that some of the people might have either attending this event or watching this video. And that is that this isn't the debate about whether or not God the Father has ever sinned. This is a debate about whether it matters. I'd like to make my position clear just right from the beginning. I don't believe the Father has ever sinned. The Church of Jesus Christ never taught that the Father has ever sinned. And I don't believe that you can look at the King Paul's sermon and honestly think that the God the Father has ever sinned. 
Now, uh, moving, on to what, moving on to my actual speech, though. All right. So uncertainty is a fact of life ordained by God himself. And there are things we just don't know, things that we can't know in this life. Through the restoration of the gospel, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has answers to many of those kinds of questions that people are most uncertain about. Things like, who am I? Why am I here? And what is the purpose of life? And along with that, we've also got answers to questions that nobody really asked, the, asked in the first place. One example is in Moses chapter 1 of Pearl of Great Price. It says, And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. But only an account of this earth and the inhabitants thereof give I unto you. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the word of my power, and there are many that now stand, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. Now, sometimes we as Latter-day Saints tend to forget what a big deal that this is. I mean, God the Father has just confirmed that there are other worlds besides our own that were created by Him through His Son. And God just wasn't sitting on His hands for all eternity, waiting for the chance to make us. There's more than just us out there. And you can imagine how this prompts a whole bunch of follow-up questions that you want to know what's on these worlds. But unfortunately, God isn't going to tell us because He says that He only gives us an account of this earth. But it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that this would be some of the most important information in all of human history. Now, if you think about it, though, we've expanded our uncertainty in the same time as we have expanded our knowledge. We have learned something new, but it has caused a whole bunch of other follow-up questions to pop up. And if you studied LDS theology and history, you'll see that this is something that happens a lot. You might notice it's kind of like a pattern. It's like a hydra. You answer one question, and then two more grow up in its place. Now, we're happy to know more, of course, but that added uncertainty can feel uncomfortable sometimes. This is a case of added uncertainty. And that brings us to a topic at hand. Now, about one month before the eventual martyrdom at Carthage, Joseph Smith spoke at the funeral of a man who died after being crushed during an accident while digging a well. Sorry, Aaron, I do need to correct you on that. This was not a general conference talk. This was a funeral sermon. Anyway, this man was named King Follett, and the sermon that Joseph gave would unexpectedly turn out to be one of the most influential in his entire career. This is the sermon where Joseph Smith first introduced the idea that God the Father was once a mortal man. And it's worth pointing out that this sermon was not canonized, so you can still be a faithful Latter-day Saint and not believe a word of the King Follett sermon. But despite that, in practice, most of us end up incorporating the King Follett sermon into our worldview at some point. Now, if the existence of other worlds was a big deal, then the idea that God the Father lived as a mortal man on one of those other worlds is an even bigger deal. And just like before, this sparks a lot of follow-up questions. So like, for example, what did the Father do for a living? What was, was he a carpenter like Jesus? Did he have hobbies? Did he have family? Did he have friends? Was he, a, was he crucified like Jesus was? Did he, was he involved in the salvation of this other world? Now, all those are really interesting questions, and ultimately the answer to all of them is we don't know. But, uh, but the one question that we're here to discuss is, was the Father a sinful man like us, or was he a sinless man like Jesus? Now, this in turn kind of begs the question, what kinds of uncertainty are we willing to tolerate as a community of believers? Because a church needs to stand strong, and it needs to be a beacon of hope and certainty to people in uncertain times. But and they can't be all wishy-washy about some of the things that really matter, so there are some topics where they can't afford to be uncertain. But a religion can't be certain about literally everything, okay? You can't have to draw a line somewhere and say, over here are the things that I'm certain about, and over here are the things that I'm not certain about, and I'm okay with that, because, you know, no religion has literally all of the answers. Now, on a personal level, I can tell you that I'm as convinced as I personally can be that God the Father did not sin, and I can get that straight from the King Fallout sermon. It says, God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will prove it from the Bible. And that line doesn't seem explicit enough. Just a couple lines later, he goes on to say, The scriptures inform us that Jesus said, As the Father hath power unto himself, even so hath the Son hath power. To do what? Why? Do so the Father did. The answer is obvious. In a manner to lay down his life and body and to take it up again. Jesus, what are you going to do? Um, I take, to lay down my life as my Father did and take it up again. Now, I'll be honest. I don't see how any Latter-day Saint can read that and somehow be uncertain about whether Joseph is teaching that the Father has ever sinned. After all, if the Father laid down his life and then took it up again the same way that Jesus did, then I don't see any way around the fact that he would have had to live a sinless mortal life like Jesus, like Jesus did. So that's that. And if I had my way, that would be the end of it. But as Aaron has found in his years of research and dialoguing with Latter-day Saints, credit where it's due, he's found that there are a lot of people who are legitimately uncertain about whether God the Father has ever sinned. 
And what's, there are reasons for that, and I'll get into them in just a second, but what's even more mystifying is the fact that a lot of us don't really care that much about whether the Father has ever sinned. I imagine that's probably the most mystifying part of your mm -hmm. research, is just the fact that we don't really care that much. And so this is kind of in, interesting for Aaron and other la outsiders looking in, trying to understand us. And with that, we finally arrived at the million dollar question that I'm sure all of you have been wanting me to answer. How can you possibly say that it doesn't matter whether God the Father has ever sinned? Well, the truth is it comes down to priorities. Okay, Protestants, from my observations, place a strong emphasis on orthodoxy. Or in other words, your primary goal is to believe the right thing. Okay? And obviously there are a lot of different kinds of Protestants, and so I'm generalizing a little bit, but it is, I hope this at least applies to most of you. I've often heard Protestants explain that there are essential doctrines, where all of you kind of agree on those essentials, and then there are secondary doctrines, where it's okay to tolerate a little bit of uncertainty. And what makes the difference between a primary and a secondary doctrine is how much it contributes to that overall general Christian worldview. That's what I'm talking about, orthodoxy. You're basically saying that beliefs that contribute more to orthodoxy are essential, and beliefs that, contrib that contribute less to orthodoxy are secondary. So like an example of this would be infant baptism. Okay, You guys generally think infant baptism is something that is less theologically important, and so you're willing to tolerate a little bit of uncertainty. If you have another believer, you might have your own opinions on um, infant baptism, but if you meet another believer who disagrees with you, you're still willing to recognize them as a brother in Christ. You're still willing to talk about that, talk about that kind of difference without going to crossing the line to hellfire and damnation. Okay, that's what I'm talking about when I say that you guys have an emphasis on orthodoxy. Now, Latter-day Saints do these things a little bit differently. Instead of orthodoxy, we place more of an emphasis on orthopraxy. Okay, in other words, instead of believing the right thing, our goal is doing the right thing. That's not to say that the theology doesn't matter, but when we're deciding which kinds of issues we're willing to tolerate a little bit of uncertainty on, the final deciding factor is how it impacts our worship and our day-to-day -day life, living out our faith. Now, an example of how this plays out in action, again, is infant baptism. We, where you guys would say that that is a secondary issue, we would say that that is an essential issue. Because if you've got a baby, you've got to decide whether or not it needs to be baptized. And so for us, that's kind of an urgent issue. We can't tolerate uncertainty because we need to know whether we should baptize this baby. Now, if you step back for a second and apply this framework to whether the father has ever sinned, I think it starts to make a lot more sense why some of our members don't really care that much about this issue. Because in a way, this is kind of the polar opposite of infant baptism. Where infant baptism has a big, has a big impact on orthopraxy, but a relatively small impact on orthodoxy. The father's sinlessness in a past life has a big impact on orthodoxy, but almost no or impact on orthopraxy. From our perspective, it doesn't matter too much whether the father did or didn't do in some past life that we know nothing about. He is who he is now. And nothing that happened in his past mortal life changes things for us one way or another from any practical perspective. And so, since the answer to this question doesn't change how we live out our faith, we're okay with being just a little bit uncertain. You might think this is weird, and from your perspective, I can definitely understand why you think that this is weird, that we don't really care so much, but this, keep in mind that we, guys, we think a lot of things about you guys are weird. This isn't like a one-way thing. This is a clash of two different cultures, okay? You kind of see where I'm coming from here. We have different priorities as cultures, and this is kind of a byproduct. This whole uh, issue is kind of a byproduct of that. And I think that the most, Im the most productive thing that we can possibly do in this kind of situation is start to ask questions and understand what kinds of presuppositions both sides are bringing to the table. Now, it's worth mentioning that orthodoxy versus orthopraxy isn't the un only unspoken presupposition that we're talking about here. As, let's see, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but one of the big ones is that we believe that God is, a diff is the same kind of being as us, ontologically speaking, and that the difference between us and God is a difference of degree rather than a difference in kind. Now, we have some good reasons for believing this. For example, in the first chapter of Genesis, we learn that man was made in the image, or in Hebrew, the Salem of God. Our understanding of this word is the same as the academic consensus on the meaning of the Hebrew word Salem. It's a visible reproduction of a thing. And Seth was the Salem of Adam. You remember Seth, the son of Adam from Genesis. It, again, that is a visible reproduction of Adam. Uh, God commanded that Israel would not create a Salem in anything on he heaven on earth for worship. That's from the Ten Commandments. 
There's nothing about this word that expresses anything figurative or abstract about God's relationship to us. The example of Seth being the Salem of Adam is particularly helpful for understanding Genesis 1:27 because it comes from the exact same book and it's only separated by a few chapters. It's impossible to know for certain whether or not this was an intentional parallel, but it does seem likely. After all, in Genesis, when it says Seth was made in the image of his father, Adam, it's pretty clear that they're talking about a physical familial resemblance. I don't think that there's any dispute about what that phrase means specifically when we're talking about Adam and Seth. Now, based on that, I think we can safely assume the same thing is meant in Genesis 1.27 when they use the exact same word just a few chapters earlier to describe our resemblance to God. And the idea that God and man are the same species, for lack of a better term, is something that cuts to a heart of a lot of LDS and Protestant disagreements. There are some ideas that sound crazy when you're looking at it from a Protestant viewpoint that sound remarkably sane when you look at them through an LDS perspective. All right? If we have the potential to become like God someday, then it's easier to imagine the potential of God being, at one point, a sinful mortal like us. Even though I agree all the evidence points to the fact that that wasn't the case, it's still a logical possibility that a lot of our members think about and consider. All right? Especially as someone who hasn't actually read the King Fallout sermon themselves. I think that the fact that a lot of people haven't read the original does contribute to a lot of this uncertainty. But then on top of that, there's also the difference of how Latter-day Saints understand the atonement. Where Protestants typically face, ah, sorry, where Protestants typically place the focus on imputed righteousness, our focus is on the transforming power of the atonement. This is another area where I don't want to generalize too much because I know there's a lot of different kinds of Protestants and a lot of different views on the atonement. But suffice it to say that we believe that the atonement has the power to turn sinful beings like us into sinless, perfected beings like God, and most Protestants would probably disagree with that assertion. God won't change us against our will, but if we cooperate with him, then there's no limit to what he can do. Now, I hope that you're starting to see that what really matters here is our presuppositions, orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, the idea that we're made in the literal image of God rather than some kind of figurative image, the transforming power of the atonement as opposed to some other views like imputed righteousness. Those are things that matter. The only reason this topic is so controversial is because it calls into question those presuppositions. If those presuppositions weren't so controversial, then this topic wouldn't be controversial either. If we were agreed, for example, about being made in the literal image of God, then that would be a big you know, reason why this topic wouldn't matter quite so much. Let's see. I know that it's almost impossible to examine our own presuppositions in an unbiased way, but once you've separated the topic we've discussed from the presuppositions that we have, you start to see that in and of itself, it doesn't really matter too much whether the God the Father was once a sinner. What matters is those preconceptions that we're bringing to the table. Things like whether God is ontologically the same kind of being as man, or the transforming power of the atonement. Everything that matters about this topic isn't unique, and nothing that's unique about this topic actually matters. So we might as well just talk about those preconceptions directly rather than speculate about whether God the Father has ever sinned. All right. That's all I have to say for you guys. I think we're going to transition into the dialogue portion. Okay. I think in the absence of our moderator, our stated goal is to keep a balanced conversation, mm -hmm. not to domineer rhetorically over each other, mm -hmm. and then hopefully to balance out sort of the direction of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my upfront goal. And if you all feel like it's going one way, especially if I'm domineering, please speak up. But, um, in other words, you guys are our moderators for, yeah. now, for now. So uh, congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> we have every confidence in you. Well, let me let, me let you start out. What, um, how would you want to start out the dialogue? Yeah, I guess, let's see. So I guess, first of all, I'd like to say that there are a lot of points that you made that I really like. But before we get into that, I think I'd like to ask you, so you talked about in our, in our um, conversations beforehand, you talked about historical impossibility versus ontological impossibility. And I think it's fair to separate some of your points into those two categories. Like one is arguing for ontological impossibility, the other is arguing for historical impossibility. Mm -hmm. Would you define both of those terms for Sure. Actually, yeah, you probably should define that first since these are your terms. Um, it's not uh, historically possible that the World War, that World War II didn't end, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's not ontologically necessary that it had to end. Like, it, there's things that have happened that didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
That yeah, makes sense. Like, it's basically the difference between saying that it didn't happen because X Y Z says so in a history book, versus it didn't happen because the laws of physics say that it's impossible. The, the more or less is what it is the difference. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, how would you separate your points, the six points that you made, into those two categories? Um, they're they all concern ontological impossibility. I think that would be. That's why it's hard for me to separate Interesting. whether he sinned and whether it matters mm -hmm. if he sinned. Um, for a, I think for classic Christian theists, they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, what's true about God it matters inherently. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's nothing about God that uh, is true that doesn't matter. And, mm -hmm. and there's nothing about God that isn't relevant to our orthopraxy. And all of our orthopraxy should be, to use a word, doxological, oriented toward worship. Interesting. So there's nothing, you say there's nothing about God that doesn't matter mm -hmm. to our worship. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that God has a hobby of, I don't know, stamp collecting. I'm just going to throw out something random. Let's say that God likes to collect stamps in his spare time. Would you say that that matters at all to our worship? Of infinitely. Him? Yeah. Infinitely. Anything he takes interest in. Stamp collecting is infinitely. We should take interest in. Any, uh, anything that is delightful to him, we should seek to take delight in. All right. Well, I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting that answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. So, let's see, I have a couple of questions that I wrote down. So, let's see. I guess you, we should probably start with worship. Why exactly? In your sixth point, you talk about how um, this stops us from worshiping Him somehow in spirit and in truth if at one point the Father has sinned in some hypothetical past life. So yeah. can you explain to me a little bit more of that connection? Like, why would that prevent us from worshiping Him as John 4, 24 says? Because we'd only be worshiping Him as a lesser deity. We would no longer be worshiping Him as the, uh, the things that make Him uniquely worthy of worship in Scripture would no longer be true. Okay. And what would you say makes God worthy of worship? Uh, in the presentation, it would be that He is uniquely and eternally ultimate, mm -hmm. that all things are from Him, through Him, and to Him, that mm -hmm. He uh, has ase, he's ase, he's, He has aseity. Um, the fact that He is the highest and best and most prior and original giver, He's never received... Uh, that, that's, this is in the, mm -hmm. the stretch of Isaiah 40 to 48. Part of what makes God uniquely worthy of worship is that He's never learned and he's never received what he has. He has everything but received nothing, and he knows everything but learned nothing, and that is part of what makes him uniquely worthy of worship. So if he was a sinner, it destroys all of his attributes. There, there, not one attribute is left, not one uniquely worship-worthy, uniquely beautiful thing about God is left standing. Interesting. Nothing. Because for, to me, I would probably say that, you, that we worship God for a very different reason. And to kind of illustrate that, let me ask you another question. So let's say that God had all those attributes. Let's say that He is everything that you imagine to be from an ontological standpoint. Mm. Uh, but He doesn't have a relationship with humanity. Let's say this whole thing about Jesus was just a massive misunderstanding, the whole salvation, atonement, and everything. Uh, let's ignore how. Uh, obviously, we both agree that's not the case. But let's imagine that it was just somehow a misunderstanding. God doesn't really care about humanity, but He still has all of those attributes that you talked about, the aseity, Him being, have, being self-existent, all those kinds of things. So would you still worship Him in that case? I honestly have a tough time with the hypothetical because it would divorce one of his attributes from his other attributes, namely his goodness and his benevolence. Uh, he cares for what he creates. And if that were no longer the case, he just simply wouldn't be God anymore. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to evade the question. I just mm -hmm. don't, I don't know how to uh, pull one thread out of the beautiful harmony of all of his attributes with all, all, all the other attributes collapsing. Yeah, and I guess I'm trying to ask like, from kind of a deist perspective where... Um, they believe that God doesn't really care so much about humanity, but that God still exists, God still created everything. Is God still worthy of worship if He doesn't really care about us? He would not be worthy of worship if you subtracted even one attribute. Even one attribute. All of them are essential, all of them are integral, and uh, like I said in the presentation, all of them describe all the other attributes. They're mutually informing, uh, they're mutually descriptive, um, and they're, I, I love this word, they're coextensive. They, 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 they go together uh, always. So. Okay. So if we had, let's, let's imagine like some hypothetical being that had all these attributes, but minus him caring about humanity, would you still worship that mm -hmm. being? No. Okay. And so 
Yeah, that kind of leads into why I would say that we worship God. I would say it's because of his relationship with us. I would say it's because of his love toward us. It's his devotion, his unselfish devotion toward our happiness, and especially as seen through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why I worship him, not because of some list of philosophical attributes. And I think that that kind of gets across, again, that difference between orthopraxy and orthodoxy. That what you're talking about is a very orthodoxy-based approach. You worship God because of a list of theological attributes. I worship God because of my personal experiences mm -hmm. with him and because you know, I, he is my heavenly father. He is um, the person that I look to for help and salvation. And that's the reason why I worship him. And that's a very orthopraxy-based approach. Yours is an orthodoxy-based approach. Again, not saying one is better than the other. I'm just trying to illustrate that this is a cultural difference here. On Thursday night, you said, and forgive me if I'm misquoting mm -hmm. you, that it mattered more to you who he was and not what he was. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes. Can you yeah. unpack that a bit? Yeah, and I would say that, again, just the reason why I worship God is because of who he is. He has created a plan for my happiness, for my salvation. I, he's doing so many things that I could never possibly do for myself. And in the process, he has willingly endured so much loss and pain, again, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I mean, imagine a father watching his son go through something like that. Imagine convincing your son to go through something like that and knowing your son will do it because you tell him to do that. Imagine that from a father's perspective. I'm not a father yet, but I am married and we are looking to have children soon. I can only imagine what that's like. And so that's the reason why I worship him is because he is unselfishly devoted to our happiness. Yeah, I, maybe one way to put this is uh, that for classic Christian theists, his transcendence is um, the ground of his eminence. Defining those terms, mm -hmm. sorry. His transcendence is that he is uh, not like us. He's over us. He's infinite. Mm -hmm. We're finite. He never learned. We learned everything we know. Uh, he is timeless. We're, temp we're, we're only temporal. Um, and, and the list goes on. He, he uh, is over and above creation. His imminence is that he is near, within, immense, that he um, is, I mean, he says in Isaiah that he's like a shepherd who takes the, the little sheep in his arms. Mm -hmm. uh, he provides, he feeds the sparrows, he benevolently directs our life, he loves us, he cares for us, uh, his thoughts are precious toward us. A really clear example of this would be Psalm 130, 139, mm -hmm. where it says that before a word comes out of our mouth, he knows it altogether, and that he has written, a, he's the author of a book, essentially, of all the days of our life yet to be. Mm -hmm. And for the author of, I think it's David of one, Psalm 139, for the author of the psalm, that God is so transcendent uh, over time, and that he knows the definite future, which is something you and I don't, is the reason why he thinks his thoughts are so precious toward us. That he is transcendent is, serves as the ground of his imminent love for us. So uh, that, that one side of the mm -hmm. coin that we mentioned, that, he, that he's, it, it, not to put words in your mouth, but that he, mm -hmm. he is, the, the who he is for us, that he, his particular love for us, what he's done for us, is that fair mm -hmm. representation? For us, that list or that description of who he is for us is grounded in who he always has been. The, the what he's done is rooted in who he is. The, the how he has acted is connected to his very nature. We celebrate what he's done in view of the fact of what he is. The who can't be separated from the what. Yeah, to a certain extent, I'd say that the who can't be separated from the what. But part of what we're talking about is this hypothetical idea of a past life where we're assuming that the father had a, the people who think that the father never sinned are, who, who think that the father sinned are saying that the father had some different nature and then through whatever the equivalent of the atonement was back then, mm -hmm. he was changed into the being that he is now. Yeah. And the being that he is now has no bearing on the being that he apparently used to be. And so that's a little bit, uh, I, I, I agree with you. But it has to do with his attributes now rather than his attributes in some hypothetical past life. Would you say that you worship God for who he always has been in any way? Is there anything 
uh, about God's eternal past that makes him uniquely worthy of worship? Is there anything about his eternal past that makes him uniquely worthy of worship? I would say there's the fact that he is my father in heaven. Always has been? As far as I'm aware. Without the radical diminutive qualifier as far as we're concerned or as far as we can look back, but in terms of the ultimate sense of it as far back, um, I assume that in Latter-day Saint chronology there's a, an event in time that... I, I'm, I don't well, want, okay, I don't so put, go ahead. Yeah. we don't know how the spiritual birds and the bees work. I assume that we're not old enough and that God is going to explain to us when we're older. Um, but as of yet, we are not entirely clear on exactly how he is our father. We don't know how that works. Um, it could be similar to the way that it works just here in mortality, or it could be something completely different. We don't know. We also don't know whether, like you said, it's happened at some fixed point in time or whether we've always eternally had that relationship. So strip away any, everything indeterminate or unknown or uncertain. Is there anything certain about God's eternal past that makes him uniquely worthy of worship? Well, the problem is there's nothing certain, period. There, uh, prior to the presentation of the plan of salvation in the pre-mortal life, that is the earliest event that we have records of in Scripture. Past that, we have, we have like maybe a handful of facts that we know about him. And when I say a handful, I mean like a literal handful. I mean like you could take a Sharpie right on your hand and you'd still have mat, lots of room left over if you were to write every single thing that we know about the Father prior to the presentation of the plan of salvation in the pre-mortal life. So there's nothing absolutely certain about God's eternal past that makes him uniquely worthy of worship. I would say there's nothing certain about his infinite past, period. Well, okay. I'd say very, very, very little that is certain. Can you unpack the different, I saw a post of yours on mm -hmm. the, uh, the Facebook group. So yeah, yeah. Somewhat Civil Christian Debates. Is that what it's called? Yes. Uh, I think there was a post by you there. I know there was uh, about different models mm -hmm. of understanding God's mortal past or God's uh, the regress of deities. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack? I think you listed three different mm -hmm. main options. Yeah. So this was a post done in response to a lot of people who take the LDS doctrine that God the Father was once a man and then kind of assume that there is some infinite regress of God's where he had a father and then that father had a father and that father had a father when it really is a little bit more complicated like that. Again, this is an area where we have a lot of uncertainty and we're willing to tolerate that uncertainty because it doesn't have any real impact on what we do from a practical perspective. But the three main schools of thought that I've seen are one, there is infinite regression, which is personally where I lead lean, but again, I don't know. I think that it is definitely possible that there was an infinite regression of God the Father having a father, and then the, his father having a father, and so on, and backwards into eternity. I think it's possible. I have no evidence to support it. I just think that it's the most likely out of all the possibilities. Now, the second possibility is, a, is regression with an eventual end point. So maybe there was some first God somewhere. Maybe that first God was the father. And maybe, and so that we don't know. Again, we really have no idea, but again, it's possible. And then the final possibility that I put forward is just, it doesn't matter. That we don't have enough information to really make any kind of meaningful speculation. And that I don't really see the point in trying to explore that too deeply when there's really not much there in the first place. It's kind of like trying to dive headfirst into a kiddie pool. There's not, there's, the water level is just not there for you to dive into. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, uh, type a loose end. The King Fall Discourse was a general conference sermon. No, it was, uh, a, it was the whole reason why it's called the King Fall Discourse is because it was done at the funeral of a man named King Follett. So he this died, is... Well, he, he died in an accident when he was digging a well, and uh, he was a friend of Joseph Smith's, and Joseph was speaking at his funeral. Um, there may have been a general conference going on at the same time, but I, I, I could be wrong about that. But the sermon itself was a funeral sermon. It was given at the man's funeral, and it was meant to kind of comfort the people who were there and to kind of give a little bit of extra perspective on, you know, life so as this, a whole. So this is not meant as a gotcha, but it's mm -hmm. meant to highlight how um, important the sermon was, mm -hmm. how, how much of a pinnacle sermon. There's, a, there's an article... Uh, is the King Fault discourse, discourse peripheral or pinnacle? Mm -hmm. And this really contributes to um, the massive role that it played. But this is from 
Jeffrey Tucker mm -hmm. from the LDS Church History Library. Mm -hmm. He writes, um, find several resources available at the Church History Library that can add your research into the King Follett Discourse, a prominent general conference talk given by Joseph Smith shortly before his death. He, and it was delivered to t approximately 20,000 people. So it doubled as a funeral sermon, but it also doubled as a general conference sermon discourse. Uh, it, at least as I've, so. No, fair enough. It, it, in terms of like factual corrections, it matters because it wasn't uh, like, it, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was 20,000 people and it was general conference weekend. So it was pretty important. The other, sorry. Yeah, please. so and I would say the reason why I would say that it matters is not necessarily whether or not it was a funeral or whether it was a general conference talk. I'd say that what really matters here is that nobody anticipated that this would be one of Joseph Smith's most influential sermons that he would ever preach. Hmm. I'd say that nobody could have anticipated that. Um, and in terms of the actual transcription, we see that they didn't have a stenographer there. They didn't have somebody taking down Joseph's exact words. And I think that's especially important in trying to understand it. Because, you know, we have like Thomas Bullock, who was one of Joseph's scribes. He was taking notes, but he takes notes of literally everything that Joseph ever says. Uh, you also have Wilford Woodruff, who has a hobby of obsessively uh, writing in his journal. And he keeps details of like literally everything. It's actually really amazing from a historical perspective, Wilford Woodruff's journal. And then you also have two other guys who I, I forget off the top of my head who they are. Mm. But uh, you have a couple of people who were taking notes here. And later on, after Joseph was dead, about one month, you know, one month out later, Joseph was dead. And afterwards, they were reconstructing this sermon as best they could from the notes that they have. We don't actually have those notes anymore today. But they were trying to reconstruct this sermon. And so you can kind of see, though, just if you read it, that the transcription is really rough. You can see that there are a lot of ideas being developed that are never expanded on. There are arguments that seem to have parts missing. Even the part that I read that references John 5, it's... It's, a be it's at best a paraphrase, even though we know Joseph had a Bible in front of him. He was reading the quotes. The transcription that we have almost even just paraphrases it. And so as a result, we know that the ideas, the general ideas behind the King Follett Sermon are reliable, but the exact wording is less than reliable. And probably the best example for where you can see this is that one quote that you brought up at the very beginning, where you talked about how... Um, God, I will refute the idea that God has been God from everlasting to everlasting. Now, I, I know that you guys are probably going to disagree with me about a lot when it comes to Joseph Smith, but I hope that at least one thing we can agree on is that the man was not an idiot. Like, I, like I'm serious here. Like, he would have to be an idiot to actually, if that were his exact words, because there are scriptures in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon, in Doctrine and Covenants, including bits that were t written by Joseph Smith himself that say that God was God from everlasting to everlasting. And even if you read the King Follett Sermon, even if you assume that these are exact words, there are still portions that kind of assume that, you know, he, that God was God from everlasting to everlasting because he is laying down his life and taking it back up again, like in that part that I read during my opening speech. That assumes that he has the power of God, and so I assume that that would actually make him God. And so... In context, what Joseph is most likely trying to get across is that we have imagined that the father was in the role of the father from all eternity to all eternity. But I'm going to blow your minds here because he hasn't always been in the role of the father. At one point, he was in the role of the son. That appears to be what he's saying here. And Well, let me... Um, yeah, sorry, go, yeah. I, I'm talking too much. Go no, no, no. Th that was not too much. There are two major amalgamations mm -hmm. of the discourse that I know about. I think the first one's the Grimshaw. Amalgamation, is that right? Um, and the second one is the Stan Larson Amalgamation. Mm -hmm. This is published in the BYU Studies Quarterly. Mm -hmm. And he writes that, quote, the reports, the four reports, mm -hmm. have no irreconcilable parts, no contradictory statements, and it is sometimes quite amazing how easily the various accounts combine. A high degree of agreement and harmony exists among them. Every indication points to Bullock, Clayton, and Richard's versions being written as Joseph spoke. Uh, James Falconer and Susanna Morrison summarize the difference between the two amalgamations. There's the original Grimshaw amalgamation mm -hmm. and then the Larson amalgamation. Quote, Larson's versions, version deletes material added by Grimshaw and adds material from the notes that Grimshaw omitted, but nevertheless, there are no substantial differences between mm -hmm. it and any of the previous published versions. 
It is noteworthy that each of the editors who has worked with the notes of the sermon has created much the same, the final version. That should give considerable confidence in the text as we have it, even if it is only an amalgamation of notes made at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I'm not saying it's unreliable. Again, I think that the underlying ideas behind the transcription are reliable. However, I'd also just say that, again, this isn't an exact stenographic transcription. Like, they are taking down his exact words. They mm -hmm. are taking down the general ideas from his arguments. And I'd say that in context, that quote that you mentioned is most likely trying to get across the idea that God the Father has not always been in the role of the Father, but that he has still been God. Because, again, the next, like the next paragraph, he talks about the Father laying down his life and then taking it back up again, just like Jesus did. That would require, I assume at least, to be God. So there's the parallel between the Father and the Son, mm -hmm. right? The, the laying down their life. Mm -hmm. And there's the question of how connected that parallel is, right? But there's a second parallel, mm -hmm. right? There's that you have got to learn how to be gods just the, uh, the same as all the gods have done before you. Mm -hmm. So there's two parallels, us and the prior gods, and then the Father and the Son. So it sounds like the uh, direction of interpretation one's taking mm -hmm. has to do with whether you're prioritizing one of the parallels over the other. This uh, is exactly what BYU professor Rodney Turner writes, mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't mind. Yeah, go right Just ahead. a few sentences here. Quote, opinion is divided as to how closely the son's career paralleled that of his father. These and the prophet's earlier remarks are believed by some to infer that our God and his father once sacrificed their lives in a manner similar to the atonement of Jesus Christ, which mm -hmm. I take to be uh, a common view in the, in the one mm -hmm. camp. It is argued that the prophet's words suggests suggest that these gods did not simply live and die as all men do. They, quote, laid down and, quote, took up their lives in the context of sacrifice. This extrapolated doctrine rests on a somewhat inadequate, if not shaky, foundation. Indeed, it is highly doubtful. The, the pr basic process of laying down and taking up one's life is similar for all, even though it is not identical for all. So I just read that to make the point that this is an extremely intelligent BYU professor mm -hmm. who has closely studied the King Follett discourse, and he's quite aware of the uh, other interpretation of it, mm -hmm. and yet he and it, just a swath of Latter-day Saint um, thinkers have, have just not, I mean, it, it, it's not for ignorance. It's not because of ignorance that they've taken the position that maybe... Um, oh yeah, no, there are people who disagree with me. I am happy to admit that there are people who disagree with me. And for the record, I, just to be clear, I can't come up here and defend every single Mormon thinker who's ever written on understood. the Understood. Yeah, it's better to ask you. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I, I, like, you had, um, you sent me a couple of questions. One of them was about Brigham Young's thoughts. I can't defend every single leader. I can't defend every single idea that has ever been taught. I can't get up here and, because like a lot of them disagree with each other. And I mean, that's okay from my perspective because this is what I would consider to be a secondary issue. This is an issue that is not directly impacting orthopraxy. And so to me, it's okay that I am not 100% certain, even though I would say I'm about as certain as I could possibly be about this subject without actually being 100%. While still holding the position that it doesn't matter. Yes, right. while still holding the position that ultimately it doesn't matter. It's like, again, infant baptism. You guys might have very strong opinions one way or the other about this. You might look at a Baptist or a Presbyterian or whoever, and you might think, ugh, but there are so many good arguments in the Bible that disprove your position. How can you possibly disagree with me? At the same time, though, you can still you know, acknowledge that this isn't the end-all, be-all. You can still be a believer with them and despite your disagreements this is kind of one of those issues for me because ultimately it doesn't impact my the way that i live out my faith it doesn't impact my day-to-day -day practice and worship of my faith let me ask you a hard question mm -hmm. yeah go right uh, ahead. it's one of the jugular questions mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter uh whether god was a sinner if it doesn't matter if his past prior to his exaltation is irrelevant to uh, your existential Christian faith, your, your Mormon practice, your life, your orthopraxy, if that doesn't matter to uh, LDS systematics in the, in the ultimate sense. Then, um, and this is why Brigham's view was positive for a moment, it's not to project Brigham's mm -hmm. view onto you, but mm -hmm. it's to say, 
if Brigham's right and that some gods know more than others and that all the gods are still learning and they're progressing not merely an in internal increase, but they're progressing in their knowledge and power, if the, all the gods are still progressing in that manner, in principle, it sounds like, if God were the least knowledgeable deity, I'll say the most junior deity, he has been exalted for the least amount of time, he's the most recent graduate, if you might say, um, if God is the least glorious, least knowledgeable, most junior deity, you might say the least high deity, it still sounds like you would still would worship him if he was your deity, and then it wouldn't matter that he was those things. Is that fair? I'd say so. And to kind of illustrate why, let me ask you a question. So let's say you had a king that has been a king all his life. He was born and immediately got the throne. He's been a king from day one. And now, opposite to him, you have another king of another country, similar size, similar, you know, pretty similar countries. And this king, however, had, used to be a street sweeper. He hasn't always been a king. Prior to being a king, through some twist of fate, he managed to go from street, street sweeper to king. Now, both of those kings are kings now. Both of them have fairly equal power in terms of their individual kingdoms. Is one king necessarily greater than the other because one of them has always been a king versus one that used to be a street sweeper? Um, in terms of kings, they're both kings. Yeah, right? They both exactly. have the position. Exactly. But we don't view God that way. We just, we well, don't. You yeah. don't. What's that? You don't. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, for, for classic Christian theists, um, Can I interject just something? Sorry, uh, I don't think it's proper. Okay. Yeah, go yeah. Because uh, right. we might as well open up the whole floor. Right. Not, sorry, I'm not trying to be rude. No, nope, that's okay. Um, your point's taken. I, I won't even try to object to it. I would just say that's a really good example of how Latter-day Saints think, I think, about God. I'm not, I'm not even trying to be mm -hmm. uh, snide when I say that. Just uh, what, who, how bad he was in the past how long he's been God, mm -hmm. how he ranks among the other deities is irrelevant to whether you're going to worship him or whether you think he's worthy of your, your devotion. Mm -hmm. And I would question whether a ranking system exists in the first place, whether it would even be possible to rank them in that way. But if way. there was, it wouldn't if matter. If there was, it wouldn't matter. Okay. But I would question whether that is even you know, a valid idea in the first place. There, I, I don't think that you can really... There are specific ways which you can compare Jesus and the Father, for example. Mm -hmm. In some ways, Jesus is less than the Father. The Father is greater. As, by his own admission, he says the Father is greater. But in other ways, they are equal. Mm -hmm. And it kind of depends. I don't think that there's one objective way to compare them and say one of them is objectively greater because there are different ways to compare them. Hmm. Hmm. Let me open the floor for you. Uh, what, what questions would you like to... Or what path would you like to go down? Um, let's see. I wrote down a couple of questions here. Um, actually, there is one thing I wanted to say. So, again, like I said, I don't believe that the Father is sin. I believe that because I don't think the King Fall Discourse actually says that. And I think that the King Fall Discourse teaches against that. Uh, but there are a couple of arguments that he made that I really like, and I really like to honestly just highlight. I really liked his fifth point, especially. The idea that a sinner saved by grace cannot boast. Okay, I, I just wanted to say that I really liked that point because I think that it provides a very good reason, unrelated to the historical King Fall discourse, you know, whether and what Joseph like what Joseph actually said. I think it provides an excellent reason, unrelated to all of that, to suppose that God the Father has never sinned. And I, I just want, I don't really have a question to follow that up with. I just wanted to say right off the bat that I think that that's an excellent argument. And I think that I can definitely nod along and agree to that. Mm. So if you take the infinite regress view, mm -hmm. help me understand, it sounds like in common Latter-day Saint teaching that it's at least the case that sinners via the atonement can become the sort of gods who are exalted in our heavenly parents over others who have the same relationship to them as we have with our heavenly parents. Mm -hmm. So That's how, the assumption. How, yeah, so how would that square, if it does, with the notion that at least some sinners today in the LDS church might become gods who have spirit children of their own in the future who worship them? Who, who, I mean, it, it seems like Mm -hmm. If the pattern repeats, that 
some Latter-day Saints existing today who are sinners can become forgiven, cleansed, and exalted, and then boast in themselves as the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, claiming to have always been God, claiming to have never received a gift, claiming to have never learned anything. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. And let me... Okay, so... If I say that I have five fingers, am I boasting? Even though I had nothing to do with the fact that I had five fingers, is this a boast? You didn't probably give not. yourself your fingers. No, I didn't give myself my fingers. <laughs> but if I state that I have five fingers, that's not a boast. Mm -hmm. And so my kind my You could be bragging in a room my, with everybody who's who's lost a finger. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yeah, I guess so. don't that trigger no, no, your that's, point. That's fair. That's a fair point. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you honestly state your own attributes, that's not necessarily boasting. And why and I do want to say I do really like that argument. But the reason why I'm still, you know, just a little tiny bit uncertain when it comes to God the Father and when I don't, why I don't think it applies necessarily to people who are following is that if somebody honestly states their own attributes, even if they have nothing to do with what those attributes are, that, that isn't necessarily boasting. So something that God says when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, is that a boast or is that him just honestly stating his own attributes? I don't think that... I, if, if, this is an excellent topic. Let's talk about yeah. this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and so I don't know. That's why I still have the possibility, the tiny, tiny possibility open in my mind that God has possibly sinned. Mm -hmm. that, like again, I don't think it's. I don't think it's likely. I think if I had to put a number to it, I'd say it's like a 0.1 percent chance. It would require a lot of mental gymnastics in order to say that this is the truth. But I, again, I have to open up that possibility just in my mind because I'm not confident that I can say that God is absolutely boasting here as opposed to just honestly stating his own attributes. I'm going to say something. Tell me, try it out. Mm -hmm. Tell me, uh, poke some holes in it. Tell yep, me go ahead. how it fits with, for you. Everything that God tells us about himself is one, for our encouragement, and two, worthy of worship. Okay, so there's nothing he can tell us about himself that isn't impressive and, yeah, and, and worthy that. of adoration and worship. So the, the boasting uh, category for me immediately fits there because he's glorying and reveling in something uniquely beautiful about himself mm -hmm. that we can't help but go, wow, and that's everything. There's nothing boring or incidental or pedestrian or peripheral mm -hmm. about any of God's self-descriptions. Mm -hmm. They're all beautiful. They're all uniquely beautiful. Uh, there's nothing common about him. There's nothing comparable about him. And this seems to just dive right into orthopraxy for classic Christians because, mm -hmm. because part of orthopraxy is um, meditating on the beauty of God and letting that animate all that we do. Uh, walking by the Spirit, living by the Spirit, in part involves having a, a vision of the beauty of the totality of God and all that he has revealed about himself. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, sermonizing, no, I, but yeah, yeah no, all I the think, questions there. No, yeah. and also, I agree with you there. I, but again, I think that doesn't answer the question of where do we draw the line between God honestly stating his own attributes and boasting. So like if I were, let's say that we're in a room of uh, fireworks technicians and having five fingers is actually pretty rare. I'm the only one in this room that has five fingers. Even though I can honestly state I have five fingers, is that boasting or not? I, if I was in a room of people who didn't have five fingers, does that change whether it's boasting? I, and I think that... From one man honestly, to another, maybe not. Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I, and I, I'm just saying, like, where do we draw the line between boasting and not? Like, what statements have, has God made that are not boasting? Hmm. And how do you know the difference between the statements that he's made that are supposedly boasting and the statements that are not boasting? And for that matter, if he ex there are a lot of um, times when people praise God and he accepts that praise. And is it boasting to accept praise that somebody else is giving you? Is that the same kind of category of thing? I don't know. I really don't know. And that's kind of why, even though, again, I agree this is an excellent argument, I, that's mm. why I still have that little tiny bit of uncertainty here. Like, mm. I agree that you are, like, your logic is most likely sound. I agree that most likely God is boasting here. But I'm not certain because I don't really know where the line between boasting and not boasting is. Mm. Well, it seems like the difference between you and me is, for you, there might be a line. Mm -hmm. And for you, there necessarily is no line. 
that God uh, only ever describes himself in a way that is full of value and beauty and, and is uniquely worthy of worship about him. So. Okay, so you would classify all of his statements about himself as in the category of boasting. Yes. Uh, okay. Glorious beauty, it's like uh, uh, a beaming light, a blinding, incomprehensible, beautiful light, mm -hmm. all of it. Yeah. Yeah, nothing. Uh, every time he speaks, it's an occasion for worship. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. In fact, some of the key statements I pointed out, like in Revelation 4.8, <clears throat> mm -hmm. holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, uh, are in the context of worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and again, I think that this is an excellent argument. I appreciate it. I just, I have that little tiny bit of uncertainty because I don't know where the line between boasting and not boasting is. I can't definitively say where that line is, and so as a result, I can't definitively say that God is always boasting. Hmm. Well, maybe this, we can just walk away with at least this mm -hmm. um, for my position. Yeah. Um, God is always boasting in himself. Always. And everything that he says and everything that he says about himself is uniquely worthy of worship. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Latter-day Saint uh, paradigm, at least in as much as you've represented it, uh, there might be a division between certain things he says that provoke worship and that speak to unique mm -hmm. uh, incomparability, and then there's other things that might be more pedestrian, common facts about him that are not so impressive. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be crafty with words in a way that sneaks up on you, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to be straightforward with you. Is that fair? Yeah, no, I can see where you're coming from there. Yeah. yeah. Where else? Uh, let me check the time and make sure um, yeah, let's we're see. respecting what our time is it? audience. So... Looks like we have 10 more minutes. Okay. Actually, about, actually, yeah, exactly 10 more minutes. Okay. Maybe you ask me one more question, and I'll ask you one more question. Yeah. I feel like we've gotten all the meat of what I wanted to ask about, um, well, maybe like unfold a little bit about the different models, help people mm -hmm. understand. Um, in the Latter-day Saint worldview, at least some sinners become exalted gods who have a claim to worship by those who are under them. That seems like a fair statement. Yes, when we say, when we read Romans where it says that we uh, can be heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, our the kind of question that we ask is, what did Christ inherit from the Father? Because apparently we're going to be inheriting the same thing. And the way I, I see it is, okay, God, Jesus inherited something from his mother. He inherited something from his father. What did he inherit from his father? Divinity. Mm -hmm. That seems to be what that verse is saying, is that because we are co-heirs with Christ, because we are heirs of the Father, we are going to be inheriting all things. We are going to have thrones. We are going to have... Um, dominions. I, 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 let's see, I have a whole list of um, So he, he in inherited Bible. something that he didn't previously had. <laughs> that is, so I would say that Jesus has always had the traits of divinity, given that he participated in creation. I'd say that that's, that's a pretty solid um, argument that he has those traits in and of himself. But at the same time, he is also the only begotten of the Father, and he has inherited some things from the Father. And Can you inherit the attribute of never having inherited an attribute? You can if we're talking about an infinite past, because at this point we're getting into the question of, you know, what is the nature of existence? Like if From a crea creation ex nihilo standpoint, I can see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But from a... You know, more, in, more infinite past where there is no beginning, where there is no start to all of this. You can have things where um, God, the Father, and the Son have always eternally been in this kind of relationship with one another. And so... Can you, so can you inherit him, so that this attribute that the Son has of always having had full divinity, can you inherit that? Always having had full of it. So the attribute is I've always been omnipotent. Can, I can you can you inherit the attribute as can you the attribute of always having been omnipotent? Can you inherit that? I don't know if you can call that an attribute. I'd say that you've always had an attribute, like but a potential? like that, but always having an attribute isn't itself an attribute. Hmm. Well, for for us it is, uh, and, and and all of the attributes are eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I would not say that in a point in time, 
like a, in a temporal sequence where before he, he didn't have and mm -hmm. later he did have, he inherited godhood. Like once he didn't have godhood and then he did have godhood. So if I'm saying I get to inherit everything that Jesus inherits, if I, if I say that along with Romans like it's 8, 17, mm -hmm. what I'm not saying is um, I get to become the kind of being that didn't have to become the kind of being he is. I'm not, hear, hear me out. It's like mm -hmm. um, I get to share in what Jesus uh, was given, um, but Jesus wasn't gifted his deity. Right? He, he was always worthy of worship. That, that's, that's, that's the classic Christian, Trinitarian, Chalcedonian idea is that he, he never like entered into a state of having omnipotence, omniscience, worship worthiness, uh, unity with the Father. He never, he never uh, shook hands with the Father and entered into the Godhead. Um, so when we talk about inheriting what God has for, or partaking in the... Here's a, here's a really mm -hmm. clear example. Peter talks about us becoming partakers in the divine nature. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have to partake in anyone's nature to be who he is. So the very fact that I have to partake means I'm not like him. He is what he is without having partake, partook in another. Uh, he doesn't participate in someone else to become what he is. He doesn't partake in another to become what he is. So for me to partake in him, in his deity, in his nature, in his goodness, uh, still maintains that creator-creature distinction because part of what it means for God to be uniquely God is he doesn't partake in another to be what he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what I would say to that is that, yeah, I, just to reiterate again, prior to the meeting in heaven where God the Father presented the plan of salvation, we don't know anything. Like, again, handful of uh, facts that we know. And, but we do know that at that point, in time, uh, Jesus had apparently already attained the attributes of Godhood. He was sinless, otherwise he couldn't have agreed to become our mediator the way that he did. And while I understand your point that you can't be gifted something that you already have, if you are eternally in a father-son relationship that has never actually begun, which as I understand Orthodox Christians would also agree that the father and the son have always been in a kind of father-son relationship, if you have always had that kind of relationship, it's never ever started, then you can also say that they've inherited something that they've always eternally had. Can you help me understand what you mean by that? Because I took you to be favoring the infinite regress model. Yeah, so I mean this actually ties into the infinite regress model. The idea behind infinite regress isn't that, that at some infinite point in the past there was some start. It's that there has been never, there's never was a start. It's never... To the, to the cycle. Yeah, there, no, there was never some kind of start to the cycle. But in the classic infinite regress model, God progressed to become God. <clears throat> um, kind of. We don't actually, well, we don't know. I mean, honestly. So we don't, we don't know with certainty in that classic letter. Do you think, like, there's still like a measure of uncertainty and indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. But among the models available in the classic infinite regress model, God progresses to become God and has not eternally been someone who never had to progress. Again, this is a, this, we just don't know. Like, we are, Jesus was in some state prior to his incarnation, and we don't know what that state looked like. Um, he was apparently sinless. He was apparent, he apparently had the powers of creation, but at the same time, he also didn't have a moral body. He didn't have a lot of the things that we would associate with um, who he is today. And... Yeah, I, honestly, it's just a giant question mark. The, well, I guess what I'm pushing is the... The Osler idea mm -hmm. that God has always been God, asterisk, except for maybe this condescension, um, that he's always been God prior to his condescension, mm -hmm. and perhaps, I, I don't know if you'd say this, uh, always that the Father, Son, and Spirit have always been in perfect union in, in the Godhead from all eternity. Mm -hmm. That model typically is different from the infinite regress model. In the infinite regress model, uh, gods are help, helping men become gods who help men become gods who become men. Men, sorry. <laughs> Can't say, uh, who become gods. So if you're taking the infinite regress model, it's sort of like you can't borrow from the head god model. Well, so you can if God the Father was involved in salvation somehow in this past life. So would you say all so, the gods have been? Sorry to cut you I, off. Again, I don't know. Sorry. But so we know, again, I take from the King Paul discourse that God the Father was somehow involved in the salvation of some previous world. Again, no details. We don't, know, we don't know where Jesus was at this point. Um, we don't know anything about that. But 
I think it would be safe to assume that they already had that kind of father-son relationship. Again, I, I don't know. This is kind of this is me speculating here. But I think it's safe to assume they had that kind of father-son relationship. And Via spirit that, birth, at least? Uh, again, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I really have no clue. Apparently, Jesus wouldn't have had a moral body, so I assume it would be through whatever spirit birth is. Again, they haven't ex described the birds and the bees to us. We aren't old enough yet. But... Anyway, all I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of room for different viewpoints because there's just so much that we don't know. And trying to nail down, okay, this is LDS doctrine, or this is what most Latter-day Saints think. I mean, honestly, it comes down to the individual. This, Whenever you talk about something prior to the meeting in heaven where he presented the plan of salvation, again, that is the first event we have recorded in Scripture. We barely know anything before that. And there are so many possibilities that it is mind-boggling. We don't even know all the possibilities there are because we don't have the information to ask the question in the first place. And so all we can really do is take a look at what things are like now and do our best to extrapolate backwards. Now, I think it's pretty clear based on the scriptures that they, the father and the son have always had this kind of father-son relationship. At the same time, it's also, it also appears to be that the Father has engaged in the work of salvation in some previous world as per the King Paul Discourse. How do you reconcile that? There are a lot of different ways to do that. I think that they have always had this kind of father-son relationship. I don't have any idea how it works. but Is that I, word always subject to sort of a backdoor qualification? Like always as far as we know or always as far as we can see, or always as far as it's relevant to us? I mean, there's always the caveat as far as we know, because I, we are stating things that we know. So when you say always, there's a kind of Latter-day Saint. There's, there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty there, there. But there's like a different rhetorical usage of always in mm -hmm. these discussions. Where It sounds like for you, always uh, might mean for a long time with a beginning, maybe. So, I, like I said, I believe in infinite regress, so I would say that there is no beginning. I would well, say that... that not, not, not that there's no beginning to the process or the cycle, but to the, the beginning to the father-son relationship. I would say I don't believe that there is a beginning to their father-son relationship. I would say that that, is, that exists infinitely in the past, but I cannot be certain because there just isn't enough information okay. to go off of. Yeah. I hope you understand. Like, yeah, no, the, the I, all, no all... I understand the nuances you're trying to get there because, yeah. there, like I said, there are a lot of nuances. He's making a valid point that there are a lot of Latter-day Saints that do add a lot of caveats to the word always because we're mm -hmm. talking about very abstract philosophical concepts here. And, I mean, we aren't even sure whether there is an infinite past in the first place or whether linear time exists in, prior to the creation of this world or I mean, really all the things that kind of dictate what the word always means. I've had this concepts. problem with yeah. the God never sin discussion. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to ask without much qualification, mm -hmm. uh, do you agree that God never sinned? You, you might get like a reflexive yes, mm -hmm. and then two minutes later it's, well, maybe he was a sinner prior to being God, or maybe he was a sinner prior to this eternity, or maybe he was atoned by the blood of another savior such that he was forgiven and cleansed and we should no longer reckon him a sinner. We should treat him as though he never sinned, even though he was a sinner perhaps. So there's still like a rhetorical, we should affirm that God never sinned, but we mean, what we mean by it is that maybe he was a sinner, but we have a way in, in which we can say God never sinned with what I would call backdoor qualifications. Or, can uh, I add one little bit of nuance? I would say that instead of treating him as if he has never sinned, I would instead word that as treat him as who he is now rather than speculating about who he might have used to be. So if he's not a sinner anymore and he's holy now, can you ascribe to him having always been holy? <laughs> I mean, again, I believe that he never sinned, so yes. I'm saying, but if, 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 I, if, if he, he had, if he had right. sinned, if he had <laughs> sinned, then no, he would not have always been holy. Um, but with the rhetoric, with sort of the worshipful devotional rhetoric of he's never sinned, would that have still a place in Latter Day Saint uh, worshipful verbiage if he had been a sinner who was cleansed and is now perfect? I would say that we don't have a clear enough statement in Scripture to overcome every possible nuance behind the idea of he's never sinned. Like there is never, 
there's no part of scripture that goes through and individually addresses all the possible different nuances of this discussion. Like, like what you talked about with always. There are a lot of different nuances behind a lot of the words. Not, all, not all the doors and windows are shut. Not all the doors and windows are shut. Okay. I agree with you. It, is, it takes a lot of mental gymnastics to think that, you know, the God the Father sinned with all of this stuff in mind. I agree with you that it is unlikely, but I have to at least open up the possibility because there is not an absolute statement on the subject anywhere in Scripture that manages to cover all of the possible what-ifs. And there's no uh, necessary systematic or existential reason why it has to be the case. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah, so, ontologically, we do have a, the possibility in our theology because we believe that there will be <laughs> sinful people in this world who God, the whole point of the atonement is for God to elevate us to become sinless beings like we are, like he is. And with you, and we don't have the separation of, of him being an ontologically separate being that you guys do. Mm -hmm. We believe, again, that he is literally made us in his image. And that, again, most literal way possible. We are talking about a physical, familial relationship like the one that Adam had with Seth. Do you believe that your intelligence is a child of God? I I'm, that kind of gets into the question of what exactly is an intelligence and how I, how much of you is an, is a child of God? Um, okay, so probably to explain to the audience here, so Latter Day Saint scripture says that there is some eternal, uncreated part of us called an intelligence. We don't know what it is. We know that it's apparently part of our spirit, not part of our body, but we uh, don't really have any clear understanding of what an intelligence is or really anything like that. Um, so my honest answer is I have no idea because I can't point to what part of me is that intelligence. Let me let you, let me let you ask mm -hmm. the last question. I know we're probably over time already, but yeah. let, let me let you finish it out. Yeah, so I guess my, so in, in, your, in your studies of this topic, you've probably encountered a lot of Protestants who have a skewed idea of what we believe. I know that you often try to a answer, try to, at, try to hear us out as much as possible, but I know that not everyone shares that, um, that desire to hear us out and to listen to all the nuance and try to understand where we're actually coming from. And so my question is, what is unique about this discussion that makes it valuable? What is unique about this question that couldn't be discussed in some other discussion like about whether we are ontologically the same kind of being as God or about the nature of the atonement. What is special about this discussion that you can't have anywhere else that makes this matter? Maybe I, a adding to that question, how would uh, this inform and, and help improve future discussions? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be whether something matters. Because uh, sometimes we might both superficially agree to a fact and yet uh, believe it in infinitely different ways. Like, mm -hmm. I believe this because it's necessarily the case, it's integral to worship, it's essential to God, it's infinitely beautiful, and everything would fall apart if it wasn't true. And, and a Latter-day Saint might say, I agree that fact is true, but it's kind of meh. Mm -hmm. So, it's, and, it's, and, and maybe you could do the, the, the inverse, where there's certain things that I'm like, yeah, sure, but I don't know if that, that's important. And, and there's things that are uh, crucially important for the Latter-day Saint worldview. Um, Different priorities. The priority question and the what matters question, I think, gets at ultimate things. Okay, so what is it about this discussion then that is uniquely valuable? I've been asking for years, is it possible whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal? Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I have followed up with how does that make you feel? And some Latter-day Saints have said it makes me feel good because it means I'm a, even though I'm a sinner, I can become a god. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I've spent a lot of time asking um, a lot about whether they think it matters one way or the other. So I just that's it. I think that helps. Okay. I mean, I would just say in closing that I don't think that there's anything uniquely valuable about this question of whether the father sins that can't be asked in some other way. Like, again, discussing whether or not we are ontologically the same kind of being as God is where a lot of these disagreements kind of ultimately stem from. Mm -hmm. And it seems more valuable to discuss that rather than anything having to do with whether the father hypothetically sinned or not. So I guess why does this discussion uniquely matter? For us, because those two questions are the same. Who he is and who he always has been and who he mm -hmm. necessarily is are all wrapped up in the same topic. So we don't know how to, we don't know how to divorce those things. Okay, so yeah. wouldn't it be better just to discuss ontology rather than With existential oomph. 
uh, yes, like yes, yes, and this matters, and, and yes, this is beautiful, and yes, this is important. I don't know how to discuss it mm -hmm. properly without that, uh, you know, sort of like existential attention. Ah, you know. It just seems like we could be having a more productive discussion if we chose a different topic. Hmm. What topic? Well, I, I get uh, whether or not ontol God okay. is ontologically the same that. kind of yeah. being as man. Sorry. Yeah, you already said that. Well, thank you for being brave. Uh, th yeah. This question, whether it matters, God sinned. I'm, I was honestly delighted that someone was willing to, to engage. Uh, and thank you for doing it at the level that you've done it at, um, with clarity, uh, with honesty. Um, thank you for being willing to come in to the center and, and mm -hmm. be before a bunch of evangelicals to talk about it. We really appreciate it. We viscerally disagree with you, but uh, we, we want there to be more dialogue. We want there to be more clarity. We want there to be more examples. I think this has been a good model. No, I think this has been a great discussion. No, I'd be happy to do it again sometime. Cool. Yeah, maybe a good role model for not uh, being uh, beyond ourselves uh, with exasperation or uh, <laughs> uh, uh, losing self-control, saying stupid things that, that no, but are I reckless. Yeah, yeah. I especially like the cooperation. And you know, even though we don't have a moderator at the moment, I think that this has been a very productive discussion despite that. I think that the cooperation leading up to it, where both of us were kind of talking with each other, asking each other questions, you encouraged me to ask any questions that I wanted about your position before we exchanged notes. Had, yeah, we exchanged our, our notes and scripts with each other. And so, yeah, I think that this has been a great discussion, and I'd love to see more like it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Connor, take care.